Okay, get ready for a marathon. We are going to cover Figma, Canva, Photoshop, and Midjourney all within one tutorial. If you make it through this tutorial, you'll get a foundation of each one of these tools and everything that you need to know to get started and start to put those together to create some really great graphics. First up, we're going to take a look at Figma. Figma is an online design tool that is predominantly used by interface designers. Basically, anything that you see on the web or a mobile app is most likely developed in Figma. Although it is predominantly used for interface design, you can really use it for a lot of different things like posters and other types of designs. And what's great about Figma as well is that it's collaborative. And if you come over to fi uh, this file, and then plugins, it has a ton of plugins that extend its functionality as well. Today we're gonna cover the four most fundamental parts of Figma for the context of what we're doing here, which is creating native shapes, transparency and edits, and organizing frames and assets, and then doing a little bit of an overview of prototyping. So let's get started with creating native shapes. Quick overview, you have your layers here on the left and you'll have your design items on the right. So when I click a shape here, I can, let's just start with a rectangle. You'll notice that once I draw that shape, all those edit details will be there on the right. And then I'll have my layer as a rectangle here. To edit a rectangle, you can move it up and down, uh, drag it with the click. Couple notes on navigation. If you're using a Mac command, drag scroll wheel in and out, or you can click on your mouse wheel to pan, or you can uh, space bar and click to pan. So with those two navigation features, it's just really helpful to get that fluid navigation as you're going through this. Once you have that shape, there's a couple ways that you can manipulate it. If you want to chamfer or round the edges, you can use these radius here. You can double click on the element and I'm holding down shift here to lock it into place and you can manipulate the shape that way. You can also add different vector points here to change the shape as well. Once you do have that shape, you can edit the fill here and you don't just have to do a solid fill. You can also do a different types of gradients and you can even add an image to this. You can also do things like add a stroke, add different effects like a drop shadow, and adjust the settings here, like the blur. So I'm actually just dragging and clicking to adjust this, but I can also come in here and hit 50 to blur that edge. And then you can explore uh, the different types of effects that you can apply as well. Let's go ahead and create another rectangle. And you'll notice that you can also adjust some of the attributes here as well, up in the uh, both the positioning as well as the width and height of that object. So if you want a specific dimension, you can type that in. So let's just do that for demonstration purposes. Let's do 2000 by 2000. And then you can also just explore the other tools. There's also a pen tool that you can explore in terms of creating a native shapes. I created an example here too. You can start to set up perspectives and then that would help you draw on a perspective is another method to, to work with uh, native shapes. Next up, we're gonna go over transparency settings. I'm actually going to click and drag this example that I created a little bit ago. So if I have that basic shape, I can, um, I'm going to hit option and then drag and then I can do different things with the transparency. So overall transparency in any design software that you use is just a really helpful way to work with objects and make manipulations to your designs. So I always like kind of just exploring how the different layers and transparency transparencies work and then also changing the opacity here as well. So I can maybe change this to 75 um, and you can just start to play around uh, with, with those uh, effects. Let's say if you wanted to change the order, I can right click an object and then I can do something like go down to um, bring to front or send to back. 
So in this case, I can send it back. And there's also, what's helpful is there's little key commands here that show you how to make those adjustments as well with your keypad. So going to this example, I'll come back and make, make a rectangle. I'll champ for those rectangles, and then I'll just kind of play around with this transparency. And let's just make this like 50. Um, and yeah, once you have that transparency, uh, there's just different ways that you can, can work with that as well. The next item we can do is before we notice that we could add an image. So in this case, we will add an image. I'll choose an image. Okay, so I brought in an image and you can also make adjustments to that image and change the effects that way as well. So for instance, I took a screenshot here and then I did a saturation fill, but again, this is something where, you know, you bring in that image and you kind of just sift through the different shading things, sorry, the different transparency items, and you'll be surprised at some of the results and you can kind of go from there in terms of how you then want to go about um, manipulating that object or adding it to your uh, designs. So for instance, if I had this item, I might want to change the transparency here and then I could just like duplicate it and do different things. Uh, and really just at this point, you really just can play around with the different transparencies and maybe you'll discover a cool texture that you can use for a background and then write some text over that. So let's quickly review text here. Again, I can adjust the transparency. And then with that duplication feature, you can kind of just explore and play around with copying and pasting and really being fluid with it and having fun. Okay, so I think that's enough for the transparency and edits. We'll go now to organization, frames and assets. So let's say I had a lot of elements. So if I had a lot of duplicated, duplicative items, let's, um, let's kind of see how, how Figma works with this. It's actually, it can get uh, quite interesting and complex, but it's, it's a really handy feature as well. So I can, uh, let's just uh, uh, tidy up here first. And you'll notice these little purple things come up and I can adjust the spacing. Uh, for these items, I can also select all these and, and move that like that, but then it manipulates the shape, and this would just uh, change the spacing here. If I come here, I can actually, um, I'll do right click so you can see what I'm actually clicking, and I'll hit frame selection. We'll get into frames in just a little bit. Oh, this is part of organization, is creating frames. So this frame will you'll notice too that once i create the frame all my objects will be within that frame and whenever i copy and paste an item wait i first need to do one thing sorry so i have this here i have the frame here and one thing that i can do here is actually hit auto layout and you can adjust the auto layout and what's interesting about auto layout is if i copy this so i did command c command v you can just add to this page and it just maintains uh, those aspects within that frame. Uh, and then you can still come back here and adjust the spacing. I like to think of frames as windows and we won't get into some of the more nuances with frames within frames and organizing content in that way. That is really more for strictly for interface design where you need to have a lot of rules based on spacing and you need to keep those consistent but just know that uh, you can start to organize these frames with using auto layout as well as adjusting with the purple for now that's that's really um, the key thing here another item which is kind of interesting is let's just say i had one shape here i could actually turn this into an asset wait i'm actually going to turn I'm gonna make sure I have the object selected and turn that into an asset. Okay, so I have my frame, then I have my asset. Once I create an asset, it basically uh, is going to create a, um, well, I'll just demonstrate it. But when I make a manipulation to that one shape, it's going to change all of those shapes. So it's just a really efficient way to change one thing that will change uh, a lot of other components. 
a lot of times people will store these assets and manage them and then that will update all the items. Note that if I click on not my root asset, I click on another one, I will change the color and that actually makes it unique. There's additional um, functionality within this, but that's really the key thing here. And what you can do as well is you can go to main component and that will make sure that you're selecting the main component of the asset to make those updates. This can save you a ton of time, especially if you have lots of duplicative frames. I can always go back to my asset and then make those adjustments and it's going to change all the elements. If I did make a unique element, it won't change that element, but uh, you can either say you want to detach that element or uh, you can reconnect it as well. So that's uh, the frames, organization and assets and using auto layout. The next thing we'll cover is a really quick way to do prototyping. So what is prototyping? If you ever wanted to do something interactive, uh, you can use prototyping. So I'll go to this prototype tab. I'll click on my frame here and I can click on an element and I can drag that element and I can either drag it. Yeah, I drag it to a specific frame and then let's say I'm going to do another example here. So if I click on this element, it's going to drag to this frame. So I'm going to change the color just so it's a stark example here. So now this is a blue color um, and we're just gonna use a, a two-step interaction to make it super simple. Actually, we're gonna add one more, which is gonna make this one blue. The key thing to remember with this is that I'll go to prototype and you'll notice that when I've duplicated it, it actually maintains that selection, uh, sorry, that pathway there. So you'll notice that now I don't have to specify this brown thing. So let's just see this in real time. You see how it keeps that, that interaction, which is, it's, is really helpful. Okay, so now what I'll do is if I, whatever that component that I want to be interactive, I click on that and then I drag it to the frame that it's going to interact with. And then let's say if I click on this element, it's going to bring me back to this frame. If I click on this element, it's going to bring me to this frame um, and so on and so forth. You kind of just build these things up. The, what I suggest is just to come create a couple flows and then just automatically try to prototype it uh, because then it will start to make a little bit more sense. But that's the overall idea for creating flows. Now let's jump into the wonderful land of Photoshop. Photoshop is an incredibly powerful image editing tool. It is primarily used for editing images and it's part of the Adobe suite and is often used in conjunction with, with Illustrator. Illustrator is also a really great program to learn and it is primarily vector-based, which means that it's really good at scaling and creating shapes. And then you can use that in conjunction with Photoshop, which is actually pixel-based. Now, because there is so much to learn about Photoshop, I thought it was really important to really break it down into the three most important aspects of Photoshop. And if you master these items and this approach to the framework of learning Photoshop, then you can always go back and learn specific tutorials about items that you're trying to do. Note that it does take a while to get comfortable with using this program. You'll need to watch multiple tutorials to really get into the nitty gritty. But I hope that this overview and looking at just selecting layers and filters, it can be a really good starting point for using Photoshop effectively and also getting started off on the right foot. Everyone has their little ways that they like to do specific things and they have reasons behind that, but it's also super valuable to learn new ways of doing things. And then you can start to refine your approach and how you like to go about creating and editing images. Okay, we're going to start off with an image. So I imported an image by going to file and you can do place embedded. And if you have an illustrator file, you can do place linked. And that means that you can update your Illustrator file or make updates in Photoshop. The next thing to note is ensuring that layers is turned on. Layers is really the foundational piece of Photoshop. And there's just a ton of functionality that you can do within just this layer panels here. 
And I also recommend that most of your primary actions happen within this layers panel because it's a good, really good way to manage your content and make edits that can then be changed later on in the design process. So let's take a look at how this works. I've placed an image and I want to start to isolate the information of this image. So what I can do is uh, Photoshop now has this item that says select an object and it will select that object automatically for me. Additionally, there are a couple other selection tools available. So you can select things as a rectangle and also as this like magnetic tool. So this is typically in the past how you would select items. And then there's also a magic wand feature, which you can use W and that automatically selects the region. Then there is the magic wand. Okay, so why is selecting so important? Once you have selected an item, there's a couple things that you can do. You can use a mask feature. So right down in this panel, there's a mask and that will cut out all the background. You can also use this just to you can also just use this to copy and paste an item. So now I would just have a person selected here on a separate layer. Once I do create a mask, I can also duplicate the layer by hitting right click duplicate. Once you do have that item duplicated, you can select between the object itself and also the mask. When you do have the mask selected, you can actually come over to image adjustments and invert that selection. So now what you'll notice is that we've isolated both the subject as well as the background. Okay, let's add some items to this and understand how the layers work as well. So I'll come down to this circle here and apply a gradient. Once you've applied that gradient, what you'll notice is you can sift through these blending modes and these blending modes are a ton of fun and a really good way to just have fun with Photoshop and really see the different things that can come up. Let's say that you only want to apply this gradient to one of those layers. So you can hit option if you are on Mac and it will just apply it to that specific layer. So you'll notice that it's just applying it to the background. You can also start to organize these things in terms of groups. And you can, let's just say this item is in a group and then I have the filter in a group. It will still apply it to everything, but I can now apply it to just that group. I can also copy and paste. So duplicate this item. And let's say I wanted to just have a more subtle effect. And that way, again, I could just control what's happening on which layer. Now let's take a look at creating our own custom texture. So I'm going to come here and do a solid color. I can then go to filter and go to filter gallery. I'm going to rasterize this. I don't need this to be a smart object and you can adjust the effects here. And for this, I'm just going to start copying and pasting these items and I'm going to continue to add a couple different filters. So I'll go back to this filter gallery and just look around on different items that I could apply. There's a texture item down here, so you can add a grain. Note that whatever color you do select, it's going to impact your filters. So if I come here and I go to filter, you'll notice that these items will now be in that color that you selected. Okay, let's do one more filter here. Whoops, I did a natural filter. I can then go back to my blending modes and just start sifting through this and see if anything kind of pops out to me. I'm just going to click all these items. I'm going to merge the layer together. I can come down here and click merge layers. I'm going to duplicate and I'm also going to use a blur motion blur. Okay. And then let's just merge this item together. And then I can again, go back to my image and just start exploring the different blending capacities. Now let's say you only want to apply it to a specific layer. So we'll take this and we can come down here and we can just apply it to the background and we can also change the opacity. So here as well, I can, you know, turn down this opacity and then increase this item as well. 
and then go back to the blending modes and see if anything uh, pops out or could be interesting. You can also copy and paste this item here as well. Whoops, it didn't paste in place. And you can also use the transparency effects there as well. If you do want to make adjustments to only that object, there's two ways that you can go about this. You could do a brightness and contrast. So here I can change the brightness and contrast and just note that it's going to impact everything below this line unless I apply it to just that layer itself. Another way that you can do this is you can go to image adjustments, brightness and contrast. The only thing with this is you need to make sure that you've created a smart object or else you won't be able to make adjustments to that images as you go, or you won't be able to make adjustment to that image as you go along. So I would have to come over here and go to layer, smart object, convert to smart object. Then when I come to image adjustments and let's say I wanna adjust the color balance, now you'll notice that I can turn on and off this effect and any effect that happens. So sometimes this is just not necessary and you can just make those minor adjustments by placing it in the layers. Other times you're gonna to want to be able to adjust this throughout the process. When you have that, then you can add the smart filter. At any point in the process too, you can just bring in an image or a texture. So here I brought in this texture and I can just go through those blending modes again and just see if anything kind of pops out. That would help add to the image that I'm trying to create. And then once again, you notice that it's applying it to all the layers. If I want to just apply it to that background layer, I can do that option and it applies to just that layer. And then I can come in and also do different transparency effects. I'm gonna come here and duplicate that. And for now, I'll have a normal capacity and I'm gonna bump this up all the way and I'm going to go to filter again. And then again, I can add different filters and effects and just at this point, you know, you can kind of just scroll through these items and just see if anything kind of comes across that might look interesting to you. Again, it can be a pretty fluid process. We can come back to the different blending modes and that's how you can just start to layer on different effects and filters and really just have fun with it. And then also just adjust opacity at any point in the process, you can kind of like turn these things on and off and see if it's actually having an impact on your image or if it's something that you actually want or is adding to the image. What's kind of cool when I do have a smart object is that I can continue to add filters to it. So I can go to this filter gallery and I can continue to layer on the different uh, effects. So I'll apply this one and then I can turn off and on that particular filter which is really nice. And then at any point in the process, I can come and adjust that filter by double clicking and I can make adjustments to it. Okay, now let's add some text. I'm going to hit T and I can also come here to add text. I'll click and drag and we're going to write smash. So, sorry, I'm always a fan of mono fonts. So we will just make this pretty big. What's kind of fun about this is that first I'll just show some of the blending features. So I, again, first thing, just kind of go through the blending features, see if anything pops out or could be interesting. Then what's kind of cool about this as well is if I drag this down in here, I can also just apply it to that background filter. So it just pops up behind the, the individual here, behind the subject. Once you've created that text layer, you can also just come here and start copying and pasting and trying out different blending modes. And just, again, just like having fun with it. Maybe you do have a version where it is going in front of him and you can start to create some depth. Also, I can hit down option and then that just automatically duplicates the layer. And that can also start to create some interesting uh, effects. And at any point you can kind of come back here and use option to get these where you need them, depending on the situation. And you can also turn off the layers as well. So let's just turn these off for now. I'm gonna try more of a blue color. Sometimes you won't be able to select the words and then you can just hit T. If you wanted to as well, what you can do is you can add a texture to just that specific um, text as well, which is pretty cool. So as you can see here, I'm just applying it to that specific text. 
so yeah, this can just kind of continue and you can just see how you can just kind of keep going, keep going and really just have fun with it and also create multiple layers that you can work with. And at any point, you know, you can say, oh, I don't really like this specific uh, filter. You can always come back here and add additional filters as well. So let's say I wanted to now blur this item. I could come to blur and we could do a motion blur. Yeah. That's just one way that you can really start to build up an image and really explore and have fun. This was the other version I came up with. Again, every time you do this process, you might come up with a completely different thing. And that's what's kind of fun about the Photoshop process is really just having fun with it. So the last time I did this, the gradient was completely different and it ended up uh, in a lot of different ways. And so each time you do this, the point is just to get the basic concepts of what we're kind of doing here and how we're building up the layers and the groups. And hopefully that gives just a really good starting point. That's all I have for Photoshop. I'm happy to answer any questions about it. As you can see, this program is fun. Next up, we're going to take a look at Midjourney. Midjourney is an AI image-based tool that uses natural language to generate images. So you actually prompt messages in Discord here. So I hit the backslash or forward slash actually, apologies. And you'll see that there's a couple options here. For this, we'll just start with an imagine prompt. And here I can type in anything. So let's just do map, graphic, red, color. It will take a couple minutes to prompt. As this is uh, loading, I do want to mention there's two versions of Midjourney. One is a free version. And then if you want a personalized bot, then you pay a subscription cost and you can use it that way. You can come to midjourney.com and go to the prompt section here. And this is really helpful for understanding how to use these prompts. So for instance, it will give examples for the types of things that it's looking for and really want to be as specific as possible. So if you hit this explore prompting, you'll see that there's different styles that you can ask for. And that just helps in trying to get what you're actually trying to get out of the tool. So for instance, if I come here and I want more of a life drawing of a map, or maybe, I mean, this looks kind of interesting, or maybe rhizograph map, I could go Imagine rhizograph map of Atlanta. All right, so now that I've generated those images, I'm kind of interested in this 3D map because maybe I could start to build off of that. And this is somewhat intriguing. So what you can do here is there's the U's and the V's. So we'll go to this version and you can also add to the prompt as well. And we'll go three. So it's one, two, three, four. And then if you hit, we'll do the use as well. So that will generate a final image here. And then you can take that to Photoshop and do additional manipulations. This, la this first one too. So let's add a variation. Oh, it didn't let me do a variation. Okay, let's do a variation here. All right. So yeah, this could be used as either an inspiration. I find that Midjourney is really good at just exploring ideas. It might not be your final thing that you choose or go with, but it's definitely good at generating ideas, exploring different things, and maybe you discover something that you didn't really think of before, and then you can go and build off of that. Uh, Midjourney is also great for creating textures. So I can come here and I will go gradient, Texture, pattern, monochromatic. Okay, so I guess it added circles to that drawing. So really nice that you can just sort of keep on building on these items. Okay, so this texture might be kind of interesting down here on the left. I can go V4 and we're going to add some color to this light reddish gradient and then texture and just see what happens there okay 
so it added some red. You can keep on adding things. We're going to do one of my favorite items in Mid Journey, which is actually adding your own images to Mid Journey, which is okay. So I just dragged and dropped an image in there, and then I can right click and I can do a copy link, and then I can type in Imagine, and I will paste that link, and I will go Enhance. I'm going to use some of that terminology here. And we're actually going to just type in block print. So then it will take that image and let's see what it does. As that's loading, I want to jump back over to the mid journey site and you can see here that you can get pretty specific. So in this user guide, you can come down to parameters and this is where you can start to add different types of more very specific uh, commands and adjustments that you want. So you can change the quality, the aspect ratio. There's a lot of different things that you can do within this. And that's how you can really start to fine tune a mid journey even more. The next item that I really like about mid journey is doing a blend so I can add two images. So let's do that. I'll add this image. And then maybe I can add like a texture type of image. So let's actually like go up to maybe I want a more, just, well, okay, let's just try this. I'm going to try some other blends as well as that's loading. And this time I'm going to actually use a word. Then we're going to, so first I'll do it with this map and we'll go boom. And you can also add prompts to that and yeah, just look through that website for those specific prompts. You can weight these items in different ways. So you can weight the images differently if you want more or less of, of something. Uh, and this is just, uh, this is <laughs> crazy. Oh my gosh. This is kind of cool. And it won't get the letters exactly right, but it will, you know, it might just spark some ideas. Um, and you can start to work with topography, topography maybe. So, Let's come back to this and we'll go image and you can even add up to five images, which is really cool. And we'll go. So a couple of things to note about mid journey as well is that sometimes things are very symmetrical and it's, um, yeah. So you have to watch that, uh, watch out for that, that things don't get too symmetrical. And another thing is, is they typically try to place humans or faces in the image very, very frequently. In order to mitigate that, let's take this example again, and I'll copy this link, and I'm going to do imagine, and I'm going to do the same prompt, I guess, which was monochrome. But this time I will do a humans minus point minus zero point. So same prompt, but then we're tweaking it a little bit. Ooh, this kind of came out interesting. It is the long story short, it looks like. It looks like it added humans. Okay, this time we're gonna try just no humans and see what happens. Okay, next up, we're going to take a look at Canva. Now, I have a love-hate relationship with Canva. On the one hand, it makes doing graphics and social media posts and promotional materials really quick and easy. And you can just do that very quickly using templates and then making customization to those templates. The customization features can be a little bit limiting and some of the design tools as well within Canva are very limiting. And so, Overall, that's why I do per prefer programs like Figma and the Adobe Suite, just because it really allows you to customize to however you like. The disadvantage of that is that then the learning curve is a lot longer and more challenging. So that's where Canva, you can just learn it really quickly and pretty much anyone can come in here and start with the template and make some edits and have a poster right off the bat. So from that perspective, it's really awesome. There are some 
items that you can still do within Canva where you can start pushing the limits of the tool. So I did want to go over some of those items. The first thing is, let's say I had just a regular image and I want to do something with that image. First off, it does have transparency, so you don't have blending modes, but you do have transparency. And what you can do is you can edit the image. This is bringing up the old editing canvas. So if you are in the new editing item, there'll be a, a, a little disclaimer here where you can revert back to the older editing. And that's just because I like that just because you can access some of these uh, items here, which is like the screen where you can kind of change the effects and the filters on images. So that can be a really effective way to, let's just move this to the top, bring it to front. That can be a really effective way to start to just manipulate the images that you have and just start having fun with it. So let's say if I wanted to like highlight this pineapple, for instance, um, yeah, you can just start to explore and have fun. And then also you can use the transparency as well um, to just really start to kind of customize as much as possible with Canva. Uh, similar to a lot of other programs, it's helpful to know, let's get back to this image here as well. I wanted the base image. is how frames work. So I'll notice like if I scale this, it's going to scale up and down, but then I can also double click and then I can go and scale the image. So basically every program is gonna have some type of thing that works with uh, frames and how it crops. Uh, so it's just helpful to know how that works. So here I'm actually cropping the image, but then I can double click and I can move and adjust uh, how I would like. You can also come into this library and kind of like find a grunge. Again, you won't be able to have a blending mode, but what you can do is go to this edit image. And for instance, you can use that screen feature and start to just create kind of your own custom textures and just have fun with it. Sometimes you uh, have to hit apply and it's, oh, there it is. It just took a second to load. Um, but yeah, sometimes you have to hit apply to make sure that effect uh, kind of went through and worked. Let's just make this into like a bar thingy. Uh, let's add some text. You can change the colors. And then again, you can do the alt drag to copy. And then you can still use those transparency effects. If I did want to do something like isolate this pineapple, you know, that would just, it would just take some work to do that. Um, you can come in here and you can create shapes um, to like crop items, um, but it just takes a little bit longer. Let's see how far we can push this. I can come up here and look at frames and maybe try to find something that would be similar, like an oval shape. And then let's just copy and paste this item in there. Or sorry, drag there. Or try to isolate just. Okay. So now we have successfully isolated just the pineapple. Oh gosh, sometimes it connects us in weird ways. Also, I don't need this to be a stroke. Okay, for right now, I don't know how to get rid of this stroke, so I'm gonna just keep it for now. Um, and let's see what we can do here. So you can start to isolate things, but yeah, this is just a little bit more challenging. I'm sure there's a way to get rid of this grit stroke. Don't know it off the top of my head, but that's completely fine. We can go ahead and, and figure that out. But just to see how you can start to explore this, uh, I really like, I do really like the um, option command where you can just copy, drag, and paste. That can be really uh, nice to do. There's also effects, so you can, yeah, have fun, add different effects, and see what kind of options there are. That's about it. I hope you enjoyed this, and I know we went through these programs really quickly, and you might need to go back and 
do some additional learning for these tools, but I hope that at least gave you a framework for how to think through each one of these tools start to really explore and have fun with these tools. The point is to feel fluid in them and not have the tool limit your imagination and actually have them use them in a way that actually generates new ideas and that is a more fluid and process where you can start discovering things through these tools rather than them limiting your imagination. So that's all I have today and I will see you around.